Good afternoon. How you doing? How are the drinks? <laughs> are you tipping your servers? OK. Well, good afternoon. My name is Alex Horton. I'm a reporter with The Washington Post. And I'm joined uh, by my panelists here for challenges to force development in a new American way of war. Chris Odery, um, he's going to be opening up some remarks. But to his left, we have Laura Juner. She's a director of research and strategic support, the National Defense University Institute for National Strategic Studies, and the longest title of all time. Uh, we have Emma Moore. She's a research assistant for the Military Veterans and Society program here at CNAS. We have Peter Levine, senior fellow at the Institute for Defense Analyses. And then to his left, we have Brad Orajan, did I get it wrong? Yeah, I did. Good luck. Uh, senior military fellow here at CNAS, and he's also an F-15C pilot and commander. Um, so the idea of this panel is keeping with the themes that we've already heard so far uh, about Russia and China and you know their, their new posture necessitates a new posture on, on part of the military, uh, but I think the community at large thinks about those things as, um, think about those things in like very easy terms that are, that are comfortable. So if China develops a new warship that can um, you know, withstand ballistic missiles, we're gonna come out with new missiles. Or if the new threat is from cyber, then we stand up a new team. Personnel, though, is a lot more murky, a lot more complicated. Uh, with very few easy answers. So we're going to dive into some of those challenges and maybe some of those solutions too. Uh, but right now we're going to hand it off to Chris and he's going to uh, discuss his new paper, Why America Needs a New Way of War. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Doherty. I'm a senior fellow with the defense team at the Center for a New American Security. Um, and for those of you who just uh, went through the uh, Taiwan exercise. Uh, some of these points may be a, a little bit um, repetitive for you, but hopefully I can liven them up a bit for you. And also you've got wine, so you're probably um, ready to listen. Um, so I think the, the primary point uh, that my report makes is that the current way that the United States fights its wars is not going to work against China or Russia. Um, and that finding really grew out of the work that I did while I was at the Pentagon, um, both kind of in the Office of Secretary of Defense for Policy, but also um, working on the National Defense Strategy. Um, we would do a lot of assessment work and you would see the areas of risk um, to our warfighting approach and you would see that it's not just kind of in onesie, twosie areas, but the risk is kind of systemic, it's broad, and it's across how we fight. Um, and that what we were doing in the budgets wasn't really shifting this risk in really meaningful and measurable ways um, in any kind of broad, broad swath, right? We, might, we could focus on a little area and perhaps change an outcome a little bit, but it wouldn't actually change the fundamental outcomes, the conflicts. And so it got me thinking that what we really need is to change the whole thing, right? And, and approach this from a clean sheet, uh, a new perspective. Um, and what that means is, is probably different things in different time frames. But the idea is that we can't fix this through sort of piecemeal, minor appro uh, approaches. We need to take kind of a more broader, holistic approach to, to fixing it. Um, and in large part, this is because how deeply China and Russia have studied our way of war over the last 30 years and have devised entire strategies and concepts, supporting capabilities that attack the weaknesses in our way of war and kind of offset some of our core strengths as a military. So there's a lot of stuff packed in there and I'm gonna focus on kind of four areas that the department needs to consider as it's trying to drive change in how the joint force fights. The first is fighting effectively at a time and place of the adversary's choosing rather than our own. And I think, you know, those of you who've been around the U.S. military for any period of time, you've probably heard the phrase, we will fight at a time and place of our choosing. And it's kind of this like somewhat ludicrous chest thumping assertion that probably isn't terribly valid, but it, it did make some sense when we were fighting against the Iraqs and Yugoslavias of the world. Um, they can't project power beyond their borders in any meaningful way, and we really could dictate the location and tempo of a conflict. Well, that gives us an enormous amount of strategic flexibility to flow forces in from our global posture, um, to prepare the theater exactly the way we want it before we initiate hostilities, and then conduct offensive operations when we feel comfortable that we've established sufficient dominance in the theater. Um, that really doesn't work against a China or a Russia. Um, their military power is much more substantial than those past opponents, and they are smart. They watched what we did to Saddam Hussein's Iraq. They are not going to sit around for months at a time waiting for us to build up the Iron Mountain of logistics on their border and then come in and destroy 
destroy their air defenses, destroy all their maritime defenses, and then take out their, their fielded forces, right? They're just not going to do that. Um, and if in the event that we do establish sufficient dominance, they do have the capacity to escalate to the strategic level. So I think the second thing I would say, um, after kind of accepting that we're not gonna control the location and the pace of a conflict, is to think about winning the battle for information at the outset as a core central part of our warfighting idea, rather than treating it as information is a support to kinetic operations um, and kind of flipping that paradigm that information is actually a, like a critical linchpin of our operations rather than something we do um, secondarily. Um, the third thing I would argue is operating without sanctuary. Um, so, you know, in the Gulf War and in, in the war against Yugos, the, the kind of two operations we did in Yugoslavia, um, the ability of those adversaries to strike us outside of the theater was extremely minimal. I mean, the, the Iraqis had a handful of extremely inaccurate Scud theater ballistic missiles, and that was kind of the extent of their ability to challenge our bases and posture um, in the Gulf region. Um, if you look at the weapon system development of China and Russia, you will see concerted investments in long-range precision strike capabilities that can target our bases, and whether those are on the land or our sea bases, um, with precision at the outset of a conflict at very long ranges. What that means is that we have a difficulty operating close into the theater like we want to. And that reduces the amount of combat power that we can bring to bear quickly and stretches out our operational timelines. So combine that with the fact that they're operating much faster and now they are forcing us to operate much slower. And you can see how they can establish a fait accompli before we could effectively respond. And the last I would say is learning to operate without dominance. And this is, a, I think, a, a critical point, um, and it, it might be a little hard to, to fully, fully grasp, but what we have done historically, um, and if you take the Gulf War I mean, as kind of the, the par excellence of this, is that we like to go in and completely destroy, or at least very, very significantly degrade, an adversary's defensive systems before we start conducting offensive operations in their territory. So obviously you know, the famous example of this in the, the Gulf War of 1990 and 91 was the sort of complete and utter destruction of the Iraqi Air Force combined with the, the real heavy effort at, at destroying Iraq's air defense system. And what that meant was that after a certain point in the war, our aircraft could more or less operate with impunity through most of Iraq. The problem is we're just never going to achieve that level of dominance against a China or a Russia. And if we try to, we're going to either bankrupt ourselves, we're gonna throw away all our munitions trying to strike defensive targets, or we're gonna suffer enormous attrition. And meanwhile, they will have taken what they wanted and say, okay, that's great, you've taken out all my air defenses, but I, I hold Taiwan or I hold the Baltics and what are you gonna to do to me now? Um, and you see that kind of outcome repeatedly when the United States tries to regain dominance, um, whether it be in war games or various forms of analysis. So I'd say those kind of, the, those are the four big areas that we ought to focus on. I would say the, the key thing about this is that we tend in the Department of Defense to focus on widgets. Um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, that we tend to focus on widgets and technology. Those things are important, but fundamentally, a new American way of war is an intellectual exercise, right? This is about the art of military strategy and the science of military operations. And I think from my perspective, that means we've got to think more deeply about the concepts that we use and the strategies that we devise. But I think from a perspective of force development in terms of personnel, that really means a lot for the kinds of people that you want to bring in and retain in the joint force, about the kinds of education that they're receiving in terms of their mental agility and flexibility. Um, and I think the last point I try to leave you with is a, is a point of hope and a point of optimism. And that is that the United States can solve this problem. Right? It's not intractable, it is very much a thing that we can solve, and we've solved harder problems in the past. Um, you know, we, we figured out deterrence theory in flight between two great power competitors who are armed to the teeth, locked at each other in, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Um, you know, we, just, we figured out the second offset strategy in the 1970s and then continued to implement it through the, the 1980s. Um, so we have faced really tough challenges as a defense establishment within living memory and we've bested them. We can do it again provided that we stare the problem in the face and, and are come to grips with it and dedicate the time, resources, and personnel to solving the problem. Thank you so much. Give my hand. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris. So as Chris pointed out, you know, a, a new way of war necessitates a new way of thinking about the concepts that we need. Um, you know, if you're going to institute emerging technologies and 
uh, everything from cyber to new weapon systems to new um, strategies taking on uh, big powers, then you need leadership and you need doctrine and you need um, critical thinkers in leadership positions. Um, so Lord, it started us off. Um, you know, it's often said that you're always stuck fighting the last war um, that you were in currently, but when it comes to leadership and leader development in the, the force, it, we're three or four or five wars back, stuck in the 1940s. So what are the issues with that? And kind of give us a picture of where we are in terms of grooming commanders and what needs to be done to, to just revamp the whole system, both for folks in and for folks coming in. Yeah, so let me, let me begin by walking, sketching very quickly um, the changing character of war. I, I don't think that topic is new to anybody here, but for, for framing, um, there are three aspects. First, uh, emerging and converging technologies are changing the potential landscape of warfare at a dizzying pace. Second, most operations will not be regional. They're going to be global. Third, the spectrum of activities short of armed conflict are growing and becoming more creative, a more significant element of warfare. So all three of these things paint a picture of warfare or military operations more generally that are fast paced and highly complex. And we need to evolve, in, in keeping with this, we need to evolve how we approach military personnel. Because in this landscape, Technical overmatch is necessary, but not, as Chris said, not sufficient for a win. We're going to, our, a technology overmatch, a slight technolo technological edge will buy you some time, but that's probably a short-term uh, advantage. We're gonna, ha we're gonna face opponents that have studied our methods, and we're gonna need to frankly outthink them in a highly complex environment, and for that reason, we're going to have to change or evolve how we identify people to join the, the national security team, and I mean that generally for a very good reason. Um, how, we, how we identify the skill sets we need, how we recruit them, how we retain them, and how we train and develop them. And I wanna focus on that last part for a while. My colleagues will focus on some of the other aspects on, this, on the last part. Um, specifically, right now, we treat military, we treat, I wish the military focused as much on intellectual development as they did f do physical development, right? And, and, if, and if you saw this, if you asked the service, service secretaries and uh, service chiefs, do you value intellectual development? They'd all say yes, but the human capital management processes really don't. Um, we have not evolved. I, I'm at uh, the National Defense University. We have not evolved how we teach fast enough. And we're in the middle of a um, department-wide initiative to adapt. We're trying to look at the development, the, the officer development continuum. So that has two parts, um, changing what and how we teach, focusing on critical thinking skills, and then the second thing is, is evolve our human capital management processes to reward intellectual achievement, and most importantly, to provide through an officer's career the sets and reps to encourage that, provide that, deli anybody a fan of uh, Dr. Erickson, um, uh, 10,000 hours, the 10,000 hours concept? The deliberate practice is how you become expert at something. And 10,000 hours is a lot of hours, but over a career with deliberate assignments, deliberate practices, focusing on education and intellectual curiosity, not as a one and done when you're at um, the Naval War College, but as a lifelong uh, expectation for your career and rewarded as such, I, I think then we'll have the type of leadership we want. Great, and I know Emma is just like brimming with follow-ups, but <laughs> I housekeeping note that I should have got to earlier, you will see pads of paper uh, on your tables. If you have a question for us, write a question on there. If you see a notepad, like a note card type deal, that's for like bigger ideas or things you want to address that uh, CNAS will collect for you know maybe future white papers uh, regarding this topic. So if you have any questions for us, go ahead and grab a pen. Uh, throughout the panel and we'll, we'll collect those uh, for the end. 
So, um, so Emma, we, Laura kind of just touched on, on how we groom leaders, but you need to start that development immediately with your, you know, your junior officers um, and civil servants. Um, so how do you find those right people to get in there in the first place? Well, I think first it's important to acknowledge that both Chris and Laura have said that while technological systems and prowess is very important, um, people also matter and they're still the backbone of our military. And currently, I think we struggle, all of the services struggle with with recognizing that people can be as important and if not more so than weapon systems, yet we tend to spend the most time and, and money on those big systems rather than the people who are behind them. And then in terms of recognizing and rewarding new talent, we have to get outside of the 18 to 22 year old recruiting pool. The Army, as, you, as we all know, has struggled cyclically because of a good economy, a bad economy to recruit people day to day. and. Part of that is their messaging, and part of it is that they've relied on three primary levers in order to recruit individuals, and that those are enlistment bonuses, um, advertising dollars, and additional recruiters. And they've, they've relied on that for decades, and it's time that they think beyond those strategies to look at new markets. That's partially ethnic and racial minorities. It's women. It's skilled professions that they haven't directly targeted before. And, they, and it's partially social media outreach. It's partially using that advertising in order to really look at a new audience. But then it's also how they're engaging with society. Right now, we tend to put out advertisements that are, you know, they're slick, they're cool, but they're, they're recruiting the people who are already interested. Warriors Wanted, the newest Army recruiting campaign, is looking towards people who already want to do combat arms, who think that it's, you know, they, they don't really need to be convinced. So who are we looking for in that, in that m middle area who have not really considered the military but maybe know of it? And then how is the military then looking at everybody else who has never considered the military and really doesn't know anything about it? Gen General McConville this morning said that 80% of the military is currently made up of children or relatives of service members themselves. And if that's your easiest recruiting pool, then that's rapidly, rapidly diminishing. Uh, we know that because the, the force is going to shrink over time as technological change continues and strength will become smaller. And that also demands a highly skilled force. So part of the solution is better messaging, it's more concrete outreach, it's actually using the platforms that they have, be it reservists, ROTC, broadening those initiatives to community or technical colleges, it's being very clear about liaising with the public and using the existing lines of communication. Yeah, so I mean, so you wrote, uh, co-wrote recently in Defense One that you know that the Pat Pentagon line is people are our greatest asset. And I was wondering if some of these things are connected because it's such a kind of conventional way of thinking. It's also something that just kind of speaks to complacency. And this is at the same time that the Army missed its recording goal last year by 6,500 soldiers on active duty. And the last time they missed it um, on active duty was 2005, which was right after Fallujah. Um, the insurgency was spinning out of control. So there was a broad messaging problem um, when it came to that. So how does it come to 2018 and they're having as bad of a time recruiting as they did in the height of the insurgency? I think people are still tired um, and the perspective is out there. When you poll youth these days, the main reason people aren't interested is they think that you know, they'll get PTSD, that they'll come back missing limbs, or that the military just fundamentally isn't a place for them. You see that with a lot of young women. They don't, they, they pull much lower on seeing the military as an option, either for a career or pathway that is interesting. And that shows that the military is doing a very poor job of showing that there are options for progression that, as we saw earlier today, that you can get degrees, you can be a higher earner than your peers, that the Army has 198 jobs, um, most of them which are not combat arms. And there, there's a huge array of options, so it's beginning to really look towards those younger communities and speak to what they want to see rather than relying on patriotism and service as your um, primary reason for joining, but that's hard because the services want to say that we're here for a reason and that reason is greater than ourselves, but in reality, a lot of young people want practical 
ways to step forward with their lives. Great. And, and Brad, I mean, that, that message sort of gets people in the door, right? Service, patriotism, uh, you know, doing something bigger than yourself. But it doesn't keep people, typically. You know, things change. They get families. They go on deployments. And the where becomes a little bit more substantial and it factors into the equation. So speaking from your experience as a, as a pilot and a commander, um, where do you see the breakdown between people are our greatest asset? We want to help people out. Because when it comes to pilot retention, it seems the Air Force's perspective is just throw money at them, and that's fine, and we'll keep them. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. So can you speak to that? Yes, sir. Um, so to speak to several of those topics, uh, believe today that it was mentioned earlier by uh, Kayla Williams in her session that the, the military recruits the military member and then retains the family. And in our, our current force structures, as mentioned by Emma, approximately, and General McConville this morning mentioned that 79% of the Army is currently recruited from military families that have experience, which is rapidly dwindling across the nation. I think back in the 1960s, about 45 to 50% of the adult male population had military experience. And then today, as you look across the forces with men and women, that number is down around 7% of the population. So that there's just less experience. And not to say we shouldn't continue to recruit from those military families because they appreciate the service that their parents uh, cross various conflicts and they have a history. Uh, they've listened to the conversations and they appreciate their, um, that military service. And speaking with the, the military families and that, the pilot retention, pilot retention is, is a generational issue that continues to come up with, uh, referred to as a, a pendulum effect that's tied in with the budget, airline hiring, and there's a constant um, back and forth of when the military, all services, are going to have a shortage of pilots. And it, it really is a um, example of not just pilot retention, but those career fields that the military needs at a certain point in time and it applies to your, your maintenance professionals. And specific to my experience as a commander and as a, a pilot in the squadrons, it really breaks down to the military member and that dynamic they have with their family and the, their ability to serve. As the military member joins the service, they're really focused on basically three things that it boils down to. And if you look back at uh, when there was testimony to Congress of why folks were getting out of the military, the first one is admirals, is folks want to serve and they want to contribute. They want to conduct the mission and support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's really what they want to sign up for. To do that, we need to provide them with the training and tools to conduct their training and become the most tactically relevant professional in, in their, their MOS or their, in the Air Force, their specialty code and the application of warfare. They, they want to get that job done. As a pilot, the first five years of your career are spent in trying to become the best aviator that you possibly can, and you're continuously going through upgrades to move past being a wingman to a flight lead to a mission commander and lead missions in complex, complex threat environments. And it's not until your, your fifth or sixth year that you're actually at that mission commander, instructor pilot. And by the time, I believe there was a RAND study that says we invest approximately for an F-22 pilot, $10 million in training to get them to the point that they're a wingman. Well, by the time you train them to be actually like an instructor pilot and an expert in that weapon system, you're probably talking three to four times that cost at six years. And in that first 10 years, you really want to spend your time learning your trade and, and being excellent. And again, and this applies to our maintainers, it's really frustrating if, if your aircraft are broken and that and you cannot fly. There's nothing more frustrating than spending an entire week getting ready for an upgrade sortie to go out and there's no aircraft to fly. And there's nothing more disappointing for our maintainers to spend all of their time getting those aircraft ready to fly, but they don't have the sufficient supply chain to keep them operational and to see the pilot come back down the, the ladder and not be able to go out and, and, and train and employ. And then as you get into, uh, as your question led into with the families, as you now get into that 10-year uh, point, our pilots are coming up and their, their, their military commitments are running up at that point in time. They have to make a decision whether to stay. And those frustrations of either not being able to get the job done, they don't have sufficient tools or resources to execute their mission, it's just been a frustration, may incentivize them to move on to the civilian workplace and transition to a commercial airline pilot. They've also been, uh, their families have been moving multiple times. But around that 10-year point, you're 
wanting to take care of your family and make sure that you have that um, support structure in place and moving multiple times. And, and one thing that we could do a lot better in, as a personal example, I've been in 20 years this month and I've moved my family 11 times. So, and one thing I think the military could do a lot better with, and General McConville talked about this this morning with the Army, of offering them a preference of where they would like to go. But I've never gone to any of those 11 assignments knowing where I'm going to go to next. And it just doesn't allow your family to go through the process of planning, um, whether it's family planning, taking care of your children's education, or, or any of those uh, factors. And it just all adds up to the, the military member's decision of whether or not they want to um, continue to serve. A complementary um, issue, and that's the so that the Air Force, the military is going to have uh, traditional pilots for the foreseeable future. But the, we've been struggling, especially when we look at force development in the future, we've been struggling with how to produce and wrap our heads around UAV pilots, right? So, UAVs and these, these new technologies that have a, whether it's man on the loop or in the loop or watching the loop, um, they're going to be an increasing part of our technological toolkit and we're going to have to figure out how to, uh, how to develop that type of, the, the human component to that type of warfare mechanism too. And I know in, when I was in the Pentagon, um, the Air Force had a critical shortage of these folks, and it, it delayed deployment orders in pretty important parts of the country. So the Air Force, they had, we had a critical shortage because the Air Force was still insisting that they all had to be officers, and we've gotten past that. Exactly. Um, in terms of the, the concern about assignments, I understand you're running into that problem with assignments, but right. I'd have to say the Air Force is working to, to, to address that right. because they're now working on this idea of, of, of a marketplace for jobs with, with, with visibility right. into what the assignments are some expression of preference and some kind of transparency. So these are things that, that, that are being worked on. And um, I guess I'm sort of trying to take in what all three of you have said, and I agree with almost all of what you said at the tactical level, but I'm not sure that I agree completely at the strategic level. So um, a, a few things, so first, first the, the, the overall agreement is there are three dimensions of what you need to do in terms of, in terms of building the force that you need for the future. You need, you need to be able to bring in the people you want, you need to be able to train them up, and you need to be able to keep them. That's, it's that simple. With, with regard to bringing them in, we face two challenges. One of the challenges is how can we continue to bring in the, the type of people we've been bringing in in the past in the face of changing demographics. And one of the major changing demographics is um, the base that we've been relying on in terms of military families and people with, with connection to the military. The connection between military and society is changing over time. Um, and another challenge, the other challenge that we bring, face in terms of bringing it, people in is not only do we face challenges in terms of bringing in the types of people we've been in, bringing in, in the past, we also need to bring in new types of people and new types of talent that we haven't brought in the past. And that brings us back to the, to the, to the new type of war. So I think all of that is consistent with what my fellow panelists have generally said. There is, there's some areas though I, I just feel like I need to disagree with. So um, first of all, in terms of the DOD says that people are the most important thing, but they don't act that way. I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. Um, I was, uh, until a couple of years ago, until the last election, I was the head of the the personnel operation, the, the entire personnel establishment in the de Department of Defense. I was just in the Pentagon today talking to people who were, who were working in that area. We have incredibly energetic people who really care about these issues, who are trying to address every issue that any of our panelists have raised, who are working actively to do that, who are willing to fight against pr the procedures and policies that are in place today and, and, and change them where necessary to be creative, to try new things. These are difficult challenges, but it's not because we don't care about them. It's not because the Pentagon doesn't care about them. Second, Laura, um, I have to say, I agree with what you say about the need for leadership, but I, I have a different perspective on it, which is I believe that we have extraordinary leaders in the Pentagon today, and, I, and you probably do too because you've worked oh, yeah. with them. Oh, yeah. And I, and I want to be clear, if we have an advantage continuing over our, our potential adversaries, one of the great advantages we have even as we lose our edge in technology, is in our people. 
and in particular no is in our people and our leadership and the flexibility of our leadership. So there are things we need to do to improve our leadership, but we are better in that area and, and, our, and our comparative advantage against our potential opponents is probably greater in that area than any other area, including today, technology. Right. So um, where do I think we need to improve in the leadership area? I think we have a major problem that we tend to build tactical leaders. You talked about the need to build tactical leadership and tactical skills that are the best. And we look at that and then we select the people who are the best tactical leaders to be the strategic leaders. And they're not necessarily the same people and the skills that we gave them in, in building up their tactical skills are not necessarily the skills that they need You've to lead at the strategic point. level. You've made the point that right. I so, so there is that that we need to do, but I want to put it in that perspective that even when it comes to strategic leadership, right. we're better than the other guys, and it's because we build flexibility and we build leadership for people who are coming up and, and trust them in a way that our adversaries don't. Um, that, and in part, it's because of, because of being a democratic society and, and, and an open, having an open type of approach, we don't expect people necessarily to be cookie cutters and just follow orders in quite the same way. We allow and encourage creativeness in our military leaders in a way that our adversaries don't. We need to be better at that, but we are better at that. We are already better at it than our adversaries right. are. Right. I, I think, I don't, I don't think stressing intellectual capabilities um, yeah. suggests that right. our leadership is poor now. Right. And, and, and if, it, if, if it came out that way, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, I, this is, I think we just need to develop a new set of intellectual skill sets as we're moving on. That doesn't, because we've got a, an evolving way of war, this is just keeping pace. Now, do I think that, that the department is not up to this challenge? Of course not. In fact, as I alluded, we are moving in that direction already. But these are the changes that we're seeing. And this is, this is hard for us too, right? So the, um, going, going back to the UAV pilots, the, the, once the Air Force saw the, what was restricting their production, they made an adjustment. My point is that this is the first of many of these type of challenges, you know, it, and it, we're going to have to be increasingly creative and use imagination yeah. in how we incorporate a new American way of war into how we develop a new future force. And, and I think that, I, I agree with you, and I think that the adjustment that the Air Force made for UAVs is particularly instructive for the kind of adjustment yes. we'll have to make because we have to think about a total force, not just military, but military, right. civilian, and contractor, which we have today. Right. But we need to think about where their places, that their, their skills that we need that we will not necessarily yeah. be able to get in the military, right. but we can get them in the contractor force or the civilian force. So we should force, probably we talk to, about that for yeah. a second, because you know, in building a new force, we, we tend to default to just the military. <laughs> But you know that may that that would sort of be ludicrous. I'm an economist, so allocative efficiency is a really big deal to me. Um, and it it's probably it's not a good idea to focus just on one source for talent and and um, human capabilities. We have three three pools to choose from: contractors, DoD civilians and our military personnel, and the military personnel come in a whole bunch of different flavors too, with the active and, and reserve component being just the most obvious um, divisor. Figuring out the optimal um, mix of talent across these pools is incredibly important, and I, I th I, I've seen the department struggle with that. Yes. Well, it's more oh, than absolutely. just the right mix of talent. It's also, right now, there are a lot of good suggestions in terms of where to put cyber, where to right. put these other critical skills, but it's premised right. under the assumption well, that even DOD civilian hiring works, and it's easier. Right. You can get a clearance joining the military in quick ship, and you're done, but right. it takes a, up to a year or more to get a clearance through the DOD proper so, or yeah. any of the other agencies. So it's it's also, if we're going to try to do the right mix, it's yeah. it has to be fixed in, in the other sectors we as have, well. We have major problems with our civilian right. workforce at DOD too, and one of the problems is, um, you refer to the cyber workforce, we've tried to put our arms around who the cyber workforce is, and we have special authorities for them, but we haven't thought coherently about what we want to do with them and how we want to manage them and how we want to grow them through careers. So just identifying all these people out there and saying, now I have special authorities for you, doesn't tell me I'm going to do something conscious with those authorities so that I can 
build the workforce that I need to, to, to address future problems. And Peter, I want to kind of touch base in a moment about the, the, uh, the idea of the Pentagon, you know, valuing its workforce. But I want to tease out something that you said about just we are the ones who value people, not our potential adversaries. And mm -hmm. I think you were talking about China. Um, and that's the comparative advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I read Emma's latest story in Defense One where China is also focusing on that. Like we, it's not like we have the great idea to invest in human capital. Uh, China has also recognized that. So what kind of challenges does that present? Well, the efficacy of China is that they can make or pivot a little bit more easily than we can given our bureaucratic systems. And it's not to say I think the DOD doesn't value its people. I think there's a difference or a gap in intent and application and that clearly the military does do a lot in order to support people who are serving, be it including contractors and civilians, but there, there's difficulty when trying to right fix any of these retention problems or recruitment because you see growing leadership right now, there's a disincentive to make significant organizational change if you're in command for two years. You know, you're gonna take risks your first year and what, clean it up the second year if you don't have long-term investment in a place or in, or in a command structure, be it, you know, the U.S. Army recruiting or TRADOC, you're really not going to push hard. So it's, it's everything from that level to the fact that retention is, um, you can't do anything absent of other change. So if you're looking at career intermission programs, which would be really important for people who want to invest in their family for a bit longer, or now that the Army is allowing individuals to opt out of promotion boards, or at least they're saying they're going to, but what happens if then they get passed over later because they're not competitive as their peers because they've decided to you know, take maternity or paternity leave or take career intermission. So it's, it, it can't exist separate from other solutions, and I think that's where the intent and application have a massive gap. And China has, per your question, China's been doing more to really invest in people by recruiting um, or compelling people with greater educational backgrounds and whatnot in order to join. And while we're, we've been trying to do that and we have a much higher quality workforce, it's, it's the convincing them that they actually want to serve in the military that is the so hardest. So if, if I could just go directly to your question though, uh, the comparative advantage versus China. Um, it's not that we have s smarter people, better educated people, or harder working people. Mm -hmm. It's that we trust them more. And so from a leadership perspective and an ability to be flexible in, in a military situation, we have that advantage. It's, it's, it's our ability to trust our people to be flexible, which, which, is, yeah. which is where they have struggled. So we have, um, at NDU, we sometimes have the PLA NDU come over and it's fascinating. Um, and they are, they ask a lot of questions about our NCO Corps. Um, because the, the one area, like their, their officer corps um, is pretty smart, pretty motivated, but it's our, the professionalism of our NCO Corps. That's a whole different thing to them. They can't quite figure it out. And they haven't connected the dot that, you know, you treat them well, you treat them as professionals, you evolve them as professionals, and poof, you got professionals. Um, but that's the, that's the one area where I think we're still far beyond them. Great. If I could touch on that for just a second also. We spent the day talking about uh, a liberal and uh, technology with the Paul Shard and Kara and their discussion today too. And one of the fundamental advantages of our society is the manner in which our, we are able to innovate, share ideas, and we incorporate that within our military. And we need to make sure that we are developing organizations both in the civilian workplace and in the military that values not only your technical or tactical expertise, but at the fundamental level, you're bringing in new ideas and innovative thoughts and how to make the system better. And the key to this for our personnel is making sure we're incorporating a whole of society and increasing the diversity of, of where we're recruiting from and how we employ our, our workforce across the total force, incorporating the active duty, the guard, and the reserve to account for these new domains of warfare and cyber and space so that we are getting all of the ideas and sharing those is in your more repress repressive uh, uh, governments like in China, they, they don't share those same ideals and they're not gonna have that level of innovation that we're gonna be able to uh, take advantage of. So a, a decade before the, the uh, national defense strategy focusing on, on China and Russia, 
um, there was a program instituted by the Pentagon to uh, recruit immigrants that had skills um, both on the medical side, if they're dentists and surgeons, uh, but also on the language and linguistic and cultural expertise sides. So if they're from Russia or Ukraine or China, um, Korea, other places, that there was sort of a drug deal implemented where the Pentagon says, well, we can't get these recruits that are native born with these skills and you want citizenship, let's make a deal. Um, so in that time, up until a couple of years ago, there was more than 10,000 of these folks. Um, so Peter, when you talk about um, the, the value you put on people and the, the respect, um, you were the uh, acting undersecretary for defense for personal readiness um, when you made some changes to this program. Um, one of them was increased scrutiny of these folks, uh, tougher background checks. Um, internally, in a, in a memo that we published at the Post um, that we obtained a couple years ago, um, there was this idea that you would continuously monitor people that were still in the force, that were naturalized, they were in operational units, um, and they're naturalized, but they are now um, being, being vetted. Um, the memo called for uh, caution because there was, quote, significant legal constraints. That came to a head earlier this year. I mean, you, you signed the memo authorizing that. And um, earlier this year, a judge ruled that that was unconstitutional on, on equal protection rules. So when you talk about a pivot to China and Russia, you're going to need linguists and experts who can go into those billets if their commanders are smart enough. Um, but they're taken off the table now by the Pentagon. So, so let me talk about a, a, few, a few aspects of that. Sure. First, um, as to the program and what happened uh, in September, October of 2016. Um, I can't talk about the details, but we had our security people come to us and say, we've got a problem because we have specific cases where, we, where, where we're being infiltrated, but we have people who have not gone through any kind of vetting process, and it turns out that there's a conscious effort to bring people into the U.S. military and get them clearances. And, and, and that was the kind of serious allegation. There was an inspector general report that was on its way, um, presumably is out by now, but the material, I can't, I can't talk about what the specifics are, but there were specifics, they're highly classified. So we felt we had to respond to that. We responded to it largely with the vetting process for people who are not yet in. The reference to people who are already in was because what we learned was that even as to the vetting requirements that were then in place, we had, uh, this was a, pro a program that was bringing in linguists, but the Army was using it not just to bring in linguists, they were bringing in people theoretically on the basis of linguistic qualifications, but to be truck drivers to meet their recruiting goals. So that while the other services were bringing in tens of people, the Army was bringing in thousands of people. And they, as they were bringing in thousands of people, they weren't even doing the simple vetting, so they weren't even following their own reg regulations. So we had people in the service who were uh, who, hadn't been, who hadn't been vetted at all, and the concern was we need to know where they are so that if we're, if we're trusting somebody who has, not, who has not been properly cleared, we need to know are we giving them highly classified information or not. It wasn't a matter of we're, we're going to be tracking them around or something, it's we need to know what our exposure is with people who are not properly cleared and who because of, because of, the way we, because of our own negligence may have access to information. As to the program as a whole, um, it was being, first, legally it was being misused by the Army because they were bringing in people for, for this narrow purpose, supposed narrow purpose, who they were really using for an entirely different purpose. As a practical matter, my view is the real problem with the MAVNI program is that it was too narrow, not that it was too broad. So it was structured so it said you could only use, you could only bring in people who are vital to the national interest, which would narrow you down to these few dozen people you need for linguistic purposes. But frankly, it's a tool that citizenship is a very attractive thing for people who are, who are legally in this country or um, quasi-legally in this country who would like to be, who would like to become citizens. It's a powerful incentive to serve in the military. And we were limiting it to this narrow category of people. And not only were we limiting it to a narrow, narrow category of people, we were limiting it to the category of people who were most likely to be security concerns. Because when we said language and cultural skills, that meant that we were particularly bringing in Russians, Chinese, Koreans, uh, Iranians, so people who came from overseas who, who we had the least ability to vet. Well, here we have this attractive tool where we have lots and lots of immigrants in this country who would be happy to serve and who would be excellent, 
excellent military people, and we weren't allowing them to come in because we had this vital standard, and so unless you had this critical language skill or, the, or were one of the two or three dentists we allowed in every year, you weren't <laughs> going to qualify for it. There's been so more of that. <laughs> we need, we needed to, what we really need to do is to broaden out that program, and if you broadened it out, frankly, you wouldn't have the security concerns because the security concerns were largely because the Army was trying to bring in thousands of, of, of these people who were who would create the greatest security concerns, not even to use them for, as linguists, but to use them for other purposes. How many MAVNI recruits um, shot up a military installation or were, were arrested for espionage? Um, so I can't tell you what the specific security concerns were. I can tell you that there were serious security concerns. I was personally briefed on them. I personally went up to Capitol Hill to brief members of Congress on them when they raised concerns, and they were serious enough that, that people who were strong supporters of the MAVNI program understood, but I can't tell, yeah. I can't tell you publicly what they were. One of the issues is, uh, is of just unevenness when it comes to vetting. So when a U.S.-born person enlists, you know, they're checked with a criminal background check and they, um, you know, take their clothes off and they be inspected for if they have any gang tattoos, uh, there's plenty of white nationalist um, infiltration in the, the service. There's a Marine Corps, uh, or Marine, um, you know, can get to the force just this week about it. Um, so I think a lot of these folks who, I mean, we talked about getting people in, but there are people in, there are thousands of these recruits, mm -hmm. um, and they see an unfair standard the problem applied that, to them. So, uh, let me finish. Sorry. And so they see an unfair standard applied to them, um, and they say it doesn't bring value to them, and they don't feel valued. I've talked to surgeons from Indonesia who, who work at hospitals here, but they can't get the security clearance. Um, and they kind of feel beaten down by the system. Well, but there's these other I issues of if you're doing that to people who now have to request asylum, who are up for deportation, they don't feel like anyone at the top is, is speaking their language or is sympathetic of their plight. We, we have had a change of administration and change of, and, and there's been developments in this since, since I made the decision. So when we did it, we had a tiered system so that it was specifically countries of concern where we were having the heightened security review. And but people I understand, of, of all countries I, were I understand. Right? No, like no. If, there, were, there were different tiers. So there were right. people who were in a higher tier for, for, hot, for stronger security review because of where they came from. So it was not no matter where you come from, you get the same review. The problem that we have, and you say, yes, yes, we do have people in, in, in service, including U.S. citizens who are problems. But the problem that we have for vetting specifically is people there, who come from leadership? Russia, China, leadership? Iran uh, is... If somebody has grown up and, and if, if somebody grew up, for example, in China and their life was spent in China and they come here and, and they've been here for, for five or six years, we don't have visibility into the prior, into, in, into the 30 years that they spent or 20 years that they spent in China. Yeah. We don't have visibility into their families. We don't have visibility into the, into the connection with the government. We have so much better visibility Without, without having to do any, any heightened scrutiny or anything for a U.S. citizen, just because they spent their lives here, they have a record here, they have family here, um, it's just very much harder, and, that, and, that, and that's where we've had the problem. Um, but as we run into these issues, uh, we run into them not only with the military, if you think of, of with the Chinese, this issue of, of Chinese scholars who are in the United States, who we, wanna, who we wanna bring into the national security arena, and it turns out that they're being paid by the Chinese government at the same time and under an obligation to, to, to bring stuff back to, to, to China. These are serious problems, and, and they're not one-dimensional problems. We have, to, we have to figure out how to come to grips with them, and, and, and it's not easy. So, well, and um, perhaps an interesting so. pivot on, that, on the force development question is that expanding MAVNI outside na the vital to the national interest is that the military and the services writ large need to rethink flexible models of service. You know, mm -hmm. the NDAA offers provisions for lateral entry, and that could be a plus up for different sure. people with skill sets, be it linguists, uh, U.S. citizens or otherwise, to come in and slot in where most needed in the services. And then additionally, when you think of wanting to develop key skill sets, be it cyber, be it other things that, could, that are increasingly important in this changing character of war, and increasing the warrant officer tracks. We see a lot of need on the, on the NCO and the enlisted side for these 
these skill sets but wanting to feel valued in their positions and one way to do so is to beef up the number of warrant officer tracks or bring back the specialist rank system in order to say we will value you and you can stay in this job you don't have to do management necessarily we see leaders grown maybe in an unideal way, people who jump ship at, at 10 years, at 12 years, because they're knocking their head against the wall, they're not in the position they want to, they want to do the work itself um, and do that personal and professional development by bringing back a system that enables them to actually do that work and values them and, and considers them leaders in that work could be a lot more valuable. And so either doing so more an officer or lateral entry to bring in the skill set you need. So it's also kind of interesting to me because there's sort of like this, um, like this mania when it comes to the Pentagon. They said these are people that we want, but we will also put them through this process that we know they're not going to pass, and we predict they're not going to pass because of our owner system that they're not tailored to foreigners. They say, well, you know, one problem for someone who's born in Oklahoma is you get paid by someone in South Korea every month. Um, that's strange for a South Korean. That's dad. You know, if so, they're family members served in a foreign military, that's dad who was conscripted. Um, so, Laura, I just want to ask you about this too. When it comes to commanders who are thinking about this, this thing, right? Like uh, what, what Peter was saying, that these are skilled, valuable people and they're going into silly positions like truck driving <laughs> um, because their commanders just have the, this glaucoma where they can't see, okay, these people need to be used the best we can. So how does that change? How, how do people... How do commanders think about their personnel as resources and not just billets? Well, so, so a lifetime ago, um, I, I, like I said, I was an economist and I started my career doing readiness management, empirical readiness management. And that ended up uh, putting me on the deve intellectual development team of something called the Defense Readiness Reporting System. And what underlies that system is um, a myriad, I think we had like 70 of the department's transactional databases. So in the beginning of OIF and OEF, you know, after the first couple of tranches went through, we were having a harder and harder time finding people to de deploy in certain skill sets, and linguists, linguists were one of them. So we were able to link up a few uh, data sets, and we could find uh, truck drivers that, that spoke Urdu, and I knew his name was Bob, and I knew where Bob was. Um, I knew where he was assigned. And so when the Army say said, well, sorry, we don't have any, um, I said, we could say, well, wait a minute, you got Bob out there driving a truck. And this, so at first they were mad. <laughs> they were bad. How dare you? How you are micromanaging? And, and so we thought, but no, we're just managing. Um, but the, it was it, it was a crawl, walk, walk, run thing. Um, nobody misallocates resources on purpose. Um, but the 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 Peter, I'd love your thoughts on this. But our, our round round peg, round hole, sort of default mechanism for how we manage people leads to Bob is available. He, his family is ready. He can go drive this truck. And the fact that he speaks Urdu is kind of secondary to my need for a truck driver right now. Um, and it, it, it's, it's highly imperfect. Um, but it gets to some of the provisions that we're gonna have to get better at. Um, some of them afforded by the last NDAA, but we're just gonna have to get better at them. But no, I tell you, regardless, knowing where to find Bob, <laughs> having the information system so he is not lost out there, uh, that was a game changer. Yeah. Um, so, so we can, in a pinch, we can do better. The, mil the military services are working to build those information systems now. I don't think I would tell you that, that, that they work as well as they should by any means. Right. Um, but keep in mind, the, 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 I understand that the truck driver problem is not, that, that I'm talking about is a little bit different. The Army does need truck drivers. And the, and, and the problem in this case was the Army was having trouble meeting its recruiting goals. Right. And this was a program where they could right. bring in other people. So they, weren't br right. they were bringing them in to be truck right. drivers because they needed more truck drivers. 
if we opened up the MAVNI program much more broadly so that we right. were dealing with people who from, were from countries that didn't have security risks, we could bring in truck drivers under that program, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. Because frankly, the Chief of Staff of the Army likes, soon to be the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, likes the MAVNI program, or liked it, because the people that he got as truck drivers were extremely well qualified and highly motivated. I mean, they're, they're good. They were dentists. They're, they may have been dentists, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, <laughs> and you know, I think Peter said there's a couple of dentists, but when the, the program was opened up uh, right after, it immediately filled half of the Army Reserve billets because it turns out it's really hard to get a dentist who makes six figures. Why do yeah. I want to go and do a part-time thing once a month as some Army Reserve unit? And, and we can laugh, but in fact, uh, dentistry is a major problem of, of, of readiness and deployability in the armed forces, and particularly in the reserves, because People who haven't gone to the dentist come up to deploy, and it turns out that they can't deploy until they get their, their dental well, problems. Well, yeah. So it's actually a big <laughs> issue that we solve. So. I'm glad you acknowledge that like, you know, immigration is also a national security imperative because a lot of those folks you know, come from other countries and that they improve the deployability of those soldiers instantly. Well, it, and and the again, the, the medical should, should be beyond question. The way we used it with, with people who, had, who created the greatest security risk to perform the lowest priority jobs just to meet our numbers was, was just a crazy use of the program. Yep. And if the program were broader, we could use it for those purposes, but use it more rationally. All right, we're gonna get to uh, some of your questions. Uh, the first, I think, is great for Emma, but feel free to jump in. Uh, everyone else. It says, it focuses on new type of war. How do you recruit and retrain, retain people with cyber warfare skills, creative IT types, who will know how to act into enemy systems? Hack specifically. Hack specifically. Interesting. Like well, I think right now the services are not marketing themselves well to cyber talent. Um, going back to the point about patriotism and that if you're going to have selfless service and trying to to talk to a community it fundamentally does not understand um, and that in part might be disqualified for other reasons. We have huge problems in the states that uh, height, weight, or other disqualifying, you know, meeting high school diplomas or um, drug use. It's, you know, marijuana is more prevalent and has been legalized across states but is not federally, which then becomes a burden for military recruitment, although some of the services are getting away from that. So it's it's part and parcel with with a community that the military wants the talent from but doesn't know how to talk to and then doesn't know how to how to bring in. So it, it's part of a larger problem. The hacker specifically I won't speak to, but yeah. uh, but cyber is is an interesting door to push to open up a conversation about broader this, recruitment this efforts. This is an area where we really can could benefit from rethinking the mix of military, yes. civilian, and contractor. Yes. That it's, a, it's an area, type, the type of people that Emma's talking about are people who may not be willing to come into the military because it's alien to them, but might be willing to work for us yes. in other capacities, and, yep. and we need to be flexible about that. Great. And uh, one last question. How do we start force development before the age of 18, i.e. Ender's Game, of grooming someone at a very young age? Or I think what this person means is just, you know, kind of before they get to the force, how do you get someone that is ready, qualified, and skilled and the kind of person you want when they walk in the door? Well, let me speak to that sort of, because as written, it kind of sounds creepy. <laughs> it also, also illegal. Yeah, also, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, creepy for a reason. The Brits recruit at 16, right. but. No, 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 so, so, so I, I, um, I, I was in charge of the National Security um, Education Program, NSAP, which was a uh, National Security Language Program. And, in, and this was a, not just DOD, it was DHS, it was the IC. Um, and what we understood, uh, you know, across the federal government, we understood that the national security languages are among the hardest languages to learn. And if you just start trying to learn them in your 30s, it's going to be rough. Right? If, but if we have more of our kids learning these languages, the nation is better no matter what these kids end up doing. So we invested the entire national security aperture invested in K through 12 ed, uh, education, immersive learning for little kids, right? All the way up through high school and, call, and um, some uh, uh, partnering universities. We have the Boren um, and the N Boren Fellows and the NSEP. Uh, the, we also have scholarships for immersive training. So this is, this is one area where it's not about it's not about grooming young warriors, 
but it's, it is about raising all tides. We have similar programs for STEM. Yeah. So I think the idea is that you know, our, our government does have, we can do things to promote learning in these, these again, intellectual skills when these kids are young. So the, the aspect of it that we have more difficulty with even than STEM and, and, and language where we are investing is we can't, we can't change the, the entire trajectory of the health of the United States. So for example, obesity becoming a greater right. and greater problem so that a larger and larger percentage of, 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 of the eligible universe or age eligible universe doesn't, wouldn't qualify for the military, those kinds of things, we haven't figured out a way to reverse those kinds of trends in our society. Well, and to push back, um, it's not so much grooming at earlier ages, it's, it's exposure at early ages to po positive messaging about the military. You know, there are Hollywood liaisons, both in New York and in LA, that the military uses to make things like Hunter Killer, um, although that movie was pretty awful. But <laughs> it's, it's the point saying, you know, it's, it's the, those liaisons are there to help foster positive and accurate images of the U.S. military, and there are probably other ways. Um, Trident Juncture is my favorite example, um, which was a NATO exercise, and the NATO used a, um, a male model as their face of, a Norwegian male model as their face, he's also a reservist, <laughs> face of the uh, of Trident Juncture, and, and he's an influencer on Instagram and was resoundingly successful yeah. uh, in creating a lot of uh, awareness of the exercise. Um, understanding that there might be some discomfort with it, why can't we use reservists or, or guardsmen who have existing presence on, on social media to say, you know, I also do this in my, in my weekend time. Um, there, there, are, there are inroads that might seem different and odd to the military, but it's, it's tapping into existing streams and, and trying to say, it's not recruiting, but it, it's saying the military is an option, it can be a cool option, it can be a boring option, but it's an option nonetheless. Those, those kinds of things were, were a key part of uh, Secretary Carter's Worst the Future right, uh, but, ag agenda. Right. There's also, following the example that uh, commercial industries like Boeing, Electric Boat, General Dynamics, with their investment of science, technology, engineering, and math into the public education system and providing information, not uh, basically recruiting for the military, but providing information that the military career field is not just your direct action combatants. 80 to 90 percent of the folks that are in the military are doing all sorts of things across the medical, engineering, sciences, advanced research, and those are excellent opportunities. And the Air Force has been recruiting in front of Captain Marvel commercials. They're, you know, they're they're going forward with the Women's World Cup. There are ways that are there are ways out there. Yeah, and maybe the uh, they're having issues because the Air Force is putting other planes in Godzilla movies. So. <laughs> That's another crisis entirely. So, uh, yeah, thank you uh, for, for coming, and thank you to our, our esteemed panelists for their expertise. Thank you. Thank you. That's good.